Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, mass shootings at two mosques in New Zealand have left 49 people dead. The suspect apparently live streaming the attacks on Facebook with a video going viral across social media. How can the biggest internet player stop the spread of violent content? Plus, U.S. state officials are in the early stages of a probe into Google, focused on antitrust and privacy in the largest coordinated effort to take on big tech since the 1990s. And a win for Qualcomm in its global dispute with Apple over how much the iPhone maker should pay for using its patented technology. But first to the story that has gripped us all today, the mass shooting at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, has left 49 people dead. The terror live streamed apparently by the suspect on Facebook for 17 full minutes before Facebook took it down. That video still went viral on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Reddit, leaving tech platforms scrambling to keep up with their users after the massacre. It is not the first time, of course, that horrific and violent incidents have been live streamed on such platforms. In August, a shooting at an esports tournament in Florida was caught on live video. And there have been other live stream murders and suicides. But in this particular case, it was neither Facebook's technology nor its human moderators that flagged the stream. Instead, it was the police. Facebook made this statement. Police alerted us to a video on Facebook shortly after the live stream commenced, and we quickly removed both the shooter's Facebook and Instagram accounts and the video. We're also removing any praise or support for the crime and the shooter or shooters as soon as we're aware. YouTube stated, our hearts go out to the victims of this terrible tragedy. Shocking, violent, and graphic content has no place on our platforms and is removed as soon as we become aware of it. As with any major tragedy, we work cooperatively with the authorities. Reddit and Twitter made similar statements. Joining me now in Seattle, we have David Chris, founder of the consulting firm Culper Partners. Before that, he was the head of the Department of Justice's National Security Division. In New York, we've got former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. for Management and Reform, Mark Wallace. He's the CEO of the Counter Extremism Project. And here with me in the studio, Tech's Global Executive Editor for Bloomberg, Tom Giles. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Ambassador Wallace, I want to start with you. The shooter clearly knew how this would play out online before this happened and the New York Times put it this way that this was a mass murder for the internet how much more terrifying does that make this situation what makes it very terrifying is that the social media companies know how this would play out this is not a sadly this is not a new problem for years the social media companies have been aware of the proliferation the weaponization of their platforms and the fact that people can recruit, propagandize, call to act. And there have been various extremist groups, right-wing extremists, uh, Islamist extremists, that have propagated online. And the notion of live streaming is not new. What's shocking is that it took, it set, it took the social media companies 17 minutes to take it down. And the technology exists that they claim that they have to remove any uploads of any video or photographs of this material instantaneously. So there should be, and it's technologically real, possible, and now, and they claim they've been doing it to prevent any of the proliferation of this material from going up online. I think there's some really hard questions that have to be posed to the social media companies, because as far as I'm concerned, they have a real responsibility in this action. I'm not accusing them of perpetrating these horrible acts, but these platforms have been weaponized. They've known about them for a long time being weaponized, and they are not doing enough to allow the proliferation of online weaponization of these platforms. Tom, the technology didn't work. The human moderators didn't catch it. 17 full minutes. Why not? If in any situation, it should be this one that this should work, whatever right. process they have in place. Right, without getting too much into the technicalities of it, a lot of these fail-safes that they put in place are meant for video that's already been recorded and then posted to these, these sites. 
it's a lot less effective when it's live video. The idea here is they want, they, you know, there's, a, there's been so many ways that social media has enabled, you know, citizen reporters to be out there with their camera capturing really important video. In case, think about the role that, that live video has played, for example, in helping us think differently about violence against black, young black men, for instance. Um, so that's just one way where there's been some kind of a redemptive social good here. Uh, what happens is, though, it's harder for the social media companies to vet that video as it's being streamed live. And what happened also in this case, in some of these cases, is you can actually repost live video to make it look like it's live. And so it's, you're, you're reposting captured video, but it, but it makes it look like it's live. And so in a sense, all these fail-safes they put in, they really don't work in these instances. And so social media has a lot more work to do. David, you're working with technology companies on some of these very issues, and I know you can't talk about specific companies, but when it comes to these human moderators, I mean, it's been well documented how difficult this job is. Vice has a new report out that some of these moderators can actually press snooze on the live videos for five minutes at a time. They can even ignore the live video streams. Despite the redemptive social good that Tom talks about here, should they be allowing live streaming at all? Well, look, the, the Internet is, a, just as your prior speakers have said, a force for good in a lot of ways, and it carries with it a lot of risks, uh, including in respect of live video. Um, this is an enormous challenge for the companies and for society as a whole, because it's a cultural as well as a technological problem. I think we're going to have to use technology here to fight technology, and as new techniques emerge, as opportunities emerge to misuse the Internet and social media platforms, we're going to have to come up with technical solutions because just the, the volume, velocity, and variety of digital data that is now out there requires machine assistance to the human moderators, and it's very taxing on the human moderators, as you say. These aren't easy problems to solve, uh, but they're vital problems to solve. Um, and we're going to need technology, but we also can't, you know, sort of subordinate ourselves to our machine overlords either. So we're going to have to have smart policy and ethics around the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence and other kinds of algorithms to police this space. Now, Ambassador Wallace, the reposting of these videos for hours after this happened is almost you know, as disturbing as, you know, the initial video itself, YouTube, and we're getting new details about how they've handled this, has told us they have removed thousands, thousands of videos related to this incident. Think about all those users out there who are perpetrating this. I mean, is this something that at this point these companies can solve? This is, let me, let me respectfully disagree with Tom and David. The technology exists here and now. The San Bernardino terror attacks were the first time that social media companies acknowledged they began monitoring. Since that time, the social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, and others, have said they've employed thousands of moderators to find live content. They knew that the exploitation of live platforms, the risks were there. But because it's a moneymaker, they proceeded and pushed it. But let's be clear. There is no excuse for any video or photographs of this incident to be uploaded in on to be repeatedly uploaded and to be viewed by anyone. The technology called robust hashing, which is a, a genesis of photo DNA, which came out of the child exploitation and abuse context and what we call eGlyph, prevents, extracts DNA signatures, if you will, of video and photographs. If I take a picture of you, Elaine, right now, and I try to re-upload that, we could immediately and instantaneously have that removed on the internet before anyone viewed it. The social media companies claim that they have this. This is not new technology, and they're not implementing it, or they're not being transparent about its implementation. Any other, any other statement to the contrary is an excuse. I don't understand, then. If they have this technology and it's available, they have all of these resources, why wouldn't they implement this technology? Because it's a, remember, the model of social media companies is about our data and content. Anything that serves to filter data or minimize data or content, the social media companies have been historically quite resistant to. Anything that tries to limit that is not good for the bottom line. And they've been slow to act, and they don't want to be transparent about it. 
ask the social media companies the number of videos, extremist videos and content that they've removed. I guarantee you it's in the tens of thousands. We at the Counter Extremism Project have highlighted and flagged thousands of that content and they have removed it. But why aren't they systematically doing it? David referred to the machine, the algorithmic solutions here. They exist. There should be no excuse for having any of this video up on the internet. It can be removed instantaneously if these platforms were running this, this content, and it's time to ask hard questions of the social media company. This is not advanced technology, and rest assured, Elaine, they know what you want to buy, what you want to purchase, what your buying habits are, but when it comes to removing content, they don't want to do that because it's not good for business. So we don't know exactly how many videos Facebook has had removed, though YouTube has said thousands. But David, do you want to respond to that? Well, look, I think that the problems are a little bit harder than that. Um, you know, there's a reference to hashtags and hashing on videos, but, you know, that's been a problem in the context of child exploitation and obscenity, and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has done some very fine work there. Nobody wants that stuff up, and yet, you know, it's not totally suppressed and removed from the internet. So I, I do think we have to ask hard questions. I do think we have to confront this problem head on and we do all have to do more, including the social media companies. Um, but I guess I think it's not as simple and as easy as all that. And these technologies, including AI and ML, are still developing. We have to understand them and use them wisely and in a proper framework. Um, as I said, we don't want to just give ourselves over to our machine overlords either. So we have to be smart and, and thoughtful about this. Now, Tom, we're being really careful not to repeat anything from the Shooter's Manifesto because it was filled with you know, clearly trolling and sarcastic comments. But there is one thing that we cannot ignore, which is a shout out that he gave to PewDiePie, which is YouTube's biggest star. He said, you know, everybody subscribe to PewDiePie, essentially. And PewDiePie, you know, made a statement about this saying, I feel absolutely sickened having my name uttered by this person. That said, this is a controversial internet character, somebody who has been accused of uh, spreading hate, anti-Semitism. You know, and graphic what, images. And graphic imagery. What about the bigger problem of the hate, the white supremacy that lives online, but there is no bright line to remove it? I mean, it's, it's clear when you need to remove a violent video or a shooting, a, you know, video of a mass shooting, right. these companies are saying it is less clear when it, it is, you know, characterized as an issue of free speech. How do you define it? How do you how do you identify? How do you put parameters around it? Because when you look at it outside of this, it's very cut and dried in my view when you have a live shooting. This was a terrible, horrible event in Christchurch. But there's others where there's a much more of a gray area. And so who do you want to be in charge of that? And you can you, you know that people would be cry, would be crying foul if there started to be this sense, and they have in fact done so, when you got a sense that maybe Facebook or Google or some of these other companies were acting as an arbiter of political views, for example, censoring, well, you know, hey, they're a little bit further right of me and we don't want them taking that content down, or if it's a little bit too far left, we don't want them taking that content down. So we don't trust Google and Facebook to be the arbiters of that. Who do we want to come in and do it? The state? Do we want the Chinese internet model? where the state is the arbiter and you don't get any images. So it's not a very easy, it's a very, it's a big conundrum. Mark, what do we want? I mean, look, these platforms have been designed for maximum engagement, public discourse, to prioritize free speech. You know, certainly you could imagine if from the beginning, you know, they had been designed for a more curated experience, maybe, maybe things would be different. At this point, do we need government intervention? And if so, what does that look like? With due respect, again, this has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. This has to do humans deciding we don't want to allow certain content on the internet and having the technology which has been widely available for a long time ready to remove it instantaneously from the internet. And let's just talk about the First Amendment and free speech. I'm a lawyer by training. When you hear a social media company start citing the First Amendment to you, it means they're on the defensive because they have something called terms of service, which has nothing to do with the First Amendment. If you go on Facebook and want to look at good old-fashioned pornography, you can't do it because they conclude that that is 
not something they want on a family-friendly program. They limit all sorts of speech on their platforms through a terms of service. It's not the First Amendment that governs it, it's the terms of service. We as a society conclude that there's all sorts of types of speech that we don't agree with. Child exploitation and abuse, stalking of women, crying a fire in a crowded theater. The social media companies, whenever they start mentioning the social, the First Amendment, that's the time to be suspicious. This is their terms of service. They don't want to enforce it. They want to have an out. And when they start getting criticized, they say First Amendment. It's just not true. Look, Tom, there is a, a point here that these companies have been built and designed by humans, and there have been choices made based on certain values by human beings, um, and, and, and these platforms could have been designed differently. It has nothing to do with technology. There was a failure to foresee a lot of the possible, I believe, there was a failure to see a lot of the possible outcomes, a lot of the ways that people would use and misuse that. I think it was a failure of imagination on the parts of some of the creators here. There was this belief that people would use this for social good. This would connect the world. This would help you, know, help you stay in touch with your grandparents and your children and your friends from across the country. And there was just this, there was very much a failure of imagination in place. But again, my question comes back to who then do we expect to enforce that? We're gonna talk about that a little bit later in the show and the role of possible government intervention. Tom Giles for Bloomberg, uh, David Chris of Culper Partners, Ambassador Mark Wallace of the Counter Extremism Pro Project, uh, a debate we could continue to have for hours and will have over the next days and weeks. Coming up, Apple is fighting back against Spotify. Why the iPhone maker says its app store has contributed to the music streaming site's success. Next, this is Bloomberg. Apple is firing back at Spotify's antitrust complaint. The iPhone maker says the music streaming giant wants all the benefits of its app store without contributing to the marketplace. Apple is even going as far as saying its app store contributed to Spotify becoming the business that it is today. Joining me here in the studio, Bloomberg's Lucas, Lucas Shaw, who covers Spotify. You also interviewed Spotify CEO Daniel Ek. Um, but first, let's talk about what Apple is saying now, because it, you know it took a couple of days to respond, but now we have quite a lengthy response. Yeah, from from Apple, from Apple addressing kind of not just this complaint from Spotify, but kind of attacking Spotify for being anti-artist and invoking some of the other disputes between Spotify and the music community. I mean, Apple and Spotify right now are sort of arguing over what the role of the App Store is in promoting the different apps on it, right? So Apple is saying that Spotify has benefited a lot from being on it. It's one of the reasons that it's the most popular paid music service in the world. Spotify is arguing that actually it would be doing even better if not for this fee that Apple charges selling through it. There's no question that the iPhone and the App Store created this whole economy. It just comes down to whether you think Apple is justified in saying we're responsible for Spotify's growth or not. Apple obviously feels it is. Uh, here's some quotes from the Apple statement. Uh, they say the majority of customers use Spotify's free ad-supported products, which makes no contribution to the App Store. Even now, only a tiny fraction of their subscriptions fall under Apple's revenue share model. Spotify is asking for that number to be zero. They go on to say, developers from first-time engineers to larger companies can rest assured that everyone is playing by the same set of rules. That's how it should be. We want more app businesses to thrive, including the ones that compete with some aspect of our business because they drive us to be better. And, and Daniel Eck told you that he couldn't quantify the impact on the business, but what customers have told them, it doesn't work on my Apple TV, it doesn't work on my Apple Watch, have led them to believe it is having a big business impact. Spotify has quantified it, I think, in some way in this filing with the European regulators. They just declined to elaborate to us, was sort of annoying. So how does this play out? You know, they, it depends on whether the European regulators decide to investigate, bring some motion. They've obviously penalized Alphabet and Google, and they could choose to investigate Apple. Spotify, I imagine, will try to rally support from other services, whether it's Deezer, which is a European music service, or other companies that feel wronged by Apple. All right. Well, uh, the EU Competition Commissioner has said they're going to look into it. So, Lucas Shaw, uh, thank you so much. Good to see you here in the studio. Coming up, Boeing 737 MAX jets could remain grounded until at least April. What we know now about the plane maker's software upgrade plans next. This is Bloomberg.
Boeing has reaffirmed the timing of a software update for the now grounded 737 MAX jets. Shares of the plane maker had reversed earlier declines after the AFP reported the fix for the 737 MAX stall prevention would be rolled out in about 10 days. In an email to Bloomberg, the company repeated that the update will be deployed in coming weeks. Meantime, a piece of the wreckage from the Ethiopia crash indicates the plane was configured to dive. This evidence is said to have helped convince the U.S. to ground the aircraft. Joining us to discuss, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst George Ferguson. So, George, what do we know about this software update and will it be enough? So the software update I've heard about is that they're going to uh, take information from two sensors on the airplane rather than just one. There's an attitude indicated that they were taken from previously and they'll use that to determine whether or not the nose ought to be pushed over to prevent a stall. And so I think that's probably good, but it still seems like there's a lot of confusion with pilots in the cockpit about how to shut off this stall inhibitor once it starts. And I think that's the problem they had uh, on the Ethiopian air flight. So to me, it's not convincing. This is absolutely the final fix. Uh, but of course, uh, it's good, good to see that they're making progress on the now, software. if indeed there were lives at stake because of this software issue, why, 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 why did it take so long for Boeing to roll this out? It has been months since the last crash. I, I, I totally agree. Um, I, I think the last crash, the line air crash, the thought was that the sensor on the airplane might have been most of what was wrong with that crash. I think since then with the Ethiopian air flight, again, since we don't think there's a sensor at fault, or we don't even know yet till we see the black box, the concern could be that it's more software driven than it was a sensor driven before. When are we going to have more answers, definitive answers about the cause of this crash? I think as soon as we get these black box open, right, I think this weekend we'll see work on it. Then we're going to see more definitive answers as to whether or not all the systems on the airplane were working. Again, the stuff I hear from the field, even from pilots that have flown it and managed through this problem with the push, the um, stall inhibitor, is that it can be bulky, hard to use, hard to figure out how to shut off. And so I wonder if Boeing won't need something in the cockpit that's a lot more clear to say, hit this and it'll go off, sort of simplistically speaking, because I think that's part of the, the problem here on the, uh, on the Ethiopian air flight. The guy didn't know how to get the, the uh, pushover uh, you know, uh, system shut off. All right, George Ferguson at Bloomberg Intelligence. Of course, we're going to continue to cover this story as it continues to develop. Thank you. Coming up, we continue our look at the fallout over the live streaming of mass shooting in New Zealand. That is next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's return now to our top story. Tragedy struck Christchurch, New Zealand, when armed terrorists attacked two mosques, killing 49 people and leaving dozens seriously wounded. Those responsible posted a live stream of their attack from their viewpoint on Facebook. And even after it was taken down, that video was reposted thousands of times online, raising the question once again, if tech can't censor itself, what does the government need to do? Joining us now to discuss, I want to bring in Jamil Jaffer, Vice President for Strategy and Partnerships at IronNet Cybersecurity in Washington, and Bloomberg's Garrett DeVink, who covers Google in New York. So, Garrett, we're getting new information from Google and YouTube about how they handled this behind the scenes. Perhaps the most stunning is that YouTube itself removed thousands of repostings of this video. Tell us a little bit more about what YouTube is saying. Yeah, I mean, we're not getting much more from YouTube. I mean, this morning, their initial reaction was that obviously they were trying to find any postings of this video and quickly take it down. Now they, they say they've removed it thousands of times. And, you know, the criticism here is why was it going up in the first place? If we knew this video existed, we knew what it looked like, why couldn't you teach your algorithms quickly to recognize new posts of it and take them down before they even showed up? And it seems that the technology to do that quickly just isn't quite there yet. So, Jamil, you know, there are so many disturbing things about this story. Yes, it's, it's the video going online even once, and then it's thousands and thousands of people reposting it. I mean, 
you can these companies even handle this or has the you know the monster already created and the genie or whatever you want to call it you can't put it back in the bottle well look emily i mean the, the obviously these companies don't want this stuff on their platforms they don't want uh, Russian disinformation. They don't want uh, terrorist videos, whether it's of this variety or of ISIS uh, beheading people in the Middle East. Uh, they're trying to get this material off their platforms because at the end of the day, they depend on user eyeballs on this. And, uh, and, so, and people are not going to come back if there's uh, videos of people being murdered in mosques or people being beheaded uh, in, out, out, out in the Middle East or, or, or Russian fake news. And so uh, people aren't coming back for that. And so these platforms have a desire and, frankly, an economic desire to get this stuff off their platforms, and they're working on it. Now, to be sure, have they done enough? No. Could they do more? Absolutely. Is the right answer federal legislation or some regulator coming in uh, to try and shut it down? Uh, we know how slow uh, federal regulation laws are. The idea somehow that they'd be able to keep up or make the technology better is, is kind of silly in my mind. Right. Let's talk about the execution, though, and I'm going to push back on you a little. I mean, murders, suicides have been live streamed on Facebook before. I mean, maybe the problem isn't with the technology. It's the fact that Facebook allows live streaming at all. You can easily go to YouTube and see plenty of things that cross the line that, that haven't been taken down yet with regard to this or, you know, other other issues. Many, many conspiracy theories have, you know, proliferated on YouTube for years and the company has, hasn't done enough about it. Well, look, I think, Emily, there's a line between conspiracy theories and things that are, you know, people have, have different ideas about the world and want to express these views. I think there's a line between that and what you'd call sort of hate speech or incitement or, or things where there are murders or suicides. I think there's a line there. And um, I suppose you could have laws that police that line. Uh, but as a general matter, at least here in the United States, our philosophy has been uh, people not to police that line. And we only bar by law the most extreme things. And that's sort of, you know, child pornography, for example. And then we let the market sort the rest of that out. And frankly, you know, I think that these companies have an economic sense. I think you're right that there have been challenges and there have been things that you and I might not want to see or, or ideas that we think are silly, you know, 9-11 uh, conspiracy theorists. That being said, it doesn't mean that the platforms have sort of responsibility to take those things down. One thing you should all, we should also think about is what responsibility do users who retweet this stuff and repost it have with respect to getting the story further out there? I think that everyone should be taking a close look at what they're doing, and if they're reposting and retweeting it, you're part of the problem, not the solution. You know, yes, but also maybe the way that the platform has designed to allow that reposting to happen in the first place is also part of the problem. Right, Garrett? I suppose so. You could argue that. <laughs> So talk to us a little bit, uh, Jamil. We had uh, Tom Wheeler, the former FCC chair, on Bloomberg earlier today talking about the very line that you know, you're, you're trying to draw here. Take a listen to what he had to say. Clearly, there are First Amendment rights and there are rights of speakers. But we need to figure out just where do you draw the line? Um, you know, what's the equivalent to shouting fire in the crowded theater? in the internet age. Jamil, where do you draw that line? Well, I mean, I think the line is where it's always been. Shouting fire in a crowded theater, shouting fire, fire in a crowded theater. This isn't that. This is something different. This is something that's vile and hugely disturbing. This isn't something that's going to incite people to further violence, although, although this might be designed to do that. So this might actually cross that line, now that I'm thinking about it as we speak here, um, because it is designed to cause terror and cause further hate. So maybe this does cross that line, right? But the question is, do we want the government coming in and regulate that, or do we want these platforms to do what they're going to do anyways? I mean, it's clear that what's happening here is these platforms are trying to take it down. They're not good at it. Could the law make it better? Could, could the law sort of force the technology to get better? That seems unlikely, and that's where I worry that we try to get sort of in regulations and sort of start changing technology in ways that are actually going to be productive at the, for the end result we want, which is rapid removal of this bad stuff. So if the government can't do it or shouldn't do it or the law you think perhaps shouldn't you know, necessarily apply here and the companies aren't doing it, whether they can't or they won't, then where does that leave us? You know, how does that keep this from happening again? Well, I do think that you know, some people can vote with their feet, right? If you're seeing stuff on social media platforms that you don't like, that you think is problematic, you can express that to the platforms. You can make that clear by getting off the platforms. And so I think these companies will realize, and I think they're already realizing, I think that since the, since the last elections, the companies are realizing that they are not benefited uh, by having this kind of material on there. We've seen a huge sort of rebellion online against terrorist videos coming from overseas. I think you're going to see the same thing happening here with this particular video. You'll see a real reaction. 
Now, there are always going to be people at the extremes who actually like this stuff and want it on there. But we're going to push those people off these platforms. We're going to push those people to the margins. And the vast majority of us who think this stuff is vile and inappropriate need to make our voices heard. And the platforms, I think, are responding. And I think they'll respond faster the more that those voices are heard. Right. Well, in this case, the extremes, you know, we're talking about thousands and thousands of times. This video has been repo reposted. So it's not necessarily a super tiny, isolated voice out there. Uh, Jamil, we could talk about this for a very long time, but I do appreciate you, you being here and sharing your thoughts. Jamil Jaffer of Ironet. Uh, meantime, Garrett, I want to talk to you about another story that you have out today about, uh, you know, we learned on Wednesday that the U.S. Justice Department had a probe into Facebook's data practices and that that probe was widening. Now we also know that Google is the focus of a group of U.S. attorneys general. They are investigating possible antitrust or consumer protection violations by Google. Tell us more, Garrett, about the scope of this case. So this is a story that was broken by our colleague Joshua Brustein, and, and the scoop here is that although there's been a lot of conversation about antitrust regulation and looking at the big companies once again, this is a, a moment where you know he's learned and, and we're able to report that several attorneys general have actually begun an investigation into Google, and it will focus on antitrust and consumer protection. So it's a very early step, but it's a it's a more concrete step than just talking about it and meeting about it and you know having congressional hearings about it. So how could this play out? I mean, this is the first time there has been such a wide-ranging probe since the Microsoft antitrust issues back in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, I think we still need to see where this is going, but I think the way that one one should read this is that it's just another kind of note in, in sort of this ongoing story of changing the way that American regulators and the American public thinks about antitrust and taking a really hard look at what's going on with Google, with Amazon, with Facebook, with Apple, maybe even with Microsoft again, and see, saying, have these companies grown too big and are they stifling competition? Of course, Elizabeth Warren running for the Democratic candidate for president has come out very strong and very specific on this issue to go so far as to say, you know, the specific companies that she would break up, how she would do it and she's really brought that conversation that's been going on in 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 some political circles for a couple years now brought that right into the mainstream and I think this story of the attorneys general doing that as well is another note in that story all right Bloomberg Tech's Garrett Devink thank you so much for weighing in I know you'll continue to report on that one for us Coming up, Elon Musk has unveiled the Tesla Model Y, but a delayed release has rekindled concerns about the company's cash position. We will have all the details next. This is Bloomberg. Qualcomm won the first U.S. jury trial in its global dispute with Apple. A federal jury in San Diego awarded Qualcomm roughly $31.6 million in damages on its patent infringement claims, boosting Qualcomm's contention that its technology provides significant value to smartphones. The verdict also means Qualcomm can ask the judge for a sales ban, but the decision doesn't cover Apple's most recent smartphone models. Tesla's Elon Musk has unveiled the electric car maker's newest vehicle. It is the Model Y, a cheaper SUV that will be available in spring of 2021. The base price, $39,000. A longer range version will cost $47,000. However, Musk spent much of his presentation on Thursday talking about the company's struggles with manufacturing. What's been the reaction? I want to bring in Loop Ventures co-founder Gene Munster. Gene, I know... Uh, much of what was announced yesterday did not live up to your expectations. How so? Well, Emily, I think there's three different pockets here. And I just want to be clear about each of them. There's the timing of Model Y. And I incorrectly uh, published something and later published a correction on this that, that this, we're going to be late at getting the Model Y out. In fact, at going over the transcripts, uh, Elon Musk has always said that they would have the Model Y out sometime late in 2020 uh, 20, uh, 20 next year. And so I just want to be clear, that piece was on track despite my mistake. 
The second piece, the actual car itself, I think that actually did exactly in line with my expectations. All of the specs, the price point, one piece that gets missed uh, in this whole thing is that the price point really is a surprise when you compare it to other SUVs and crossovers, basically half of what they cost. So this is a $39,000. If you look at the e-tron, the I-Pace, Mercedes crossover at electric versions, they're all right around $70,000. So that was spot in line. The one piece that was uh, a, a change from us, and just to be clear on this, is that we now uh, feel that there is a greater chance that they will raise money in 2019. I think that the street is generally uh, 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 accepting, generally, uh, of the belief that they will, in fact, need to raise money. Part of the reason is this loss in the first quarter that they've already talked about. Another part is some of the logistics challenges that they've had in getting cars to Europe and China. That impacts kind of the cash flow. And they obviously have this $566 million debt payment coming up in uh, the month of November. And so, uh, Emily, it's, it is kind of a, a mixed bag here, but I want to just backtrack, clear up some of my own mistakes, and, and, and give people a good uh, uh, snapshot of what happened yesterday. Well, thank you, Gene, uh, for being straight up about that. I want to talk about what the street is thinking. I've got a chart in the Bloomberg showing uh, the number of weeks of sell-offs, the number of weeks of gains. And so far in 2019, as you can see on the far right side, there's more red than green. So how concerned are you about the cash position and about the, the manufacturing issues that Musk spent so much time talking about? Well, it's a concern because this is a company that is uh, ramping several cars, Model 3, Model Y. They've talked about their challenges in manufacturing. They've been open about that. So it's naturally a concern for me. But I think that uh, when I put that in a context and put the probability, the higher probability that they raise money this year, and I believe that that would be potentially negative for the stock in the near term. But ultimately, the concern about raising money and the concern around production, I think, is a near term. And I would quantify that as kind of a one or two year, year uh, uh, phase of, of this investment. And the good news for Tesla, and this is the reason why we still believe in this story, is that this curve going from gas to electric is going to be so dramatic over the next decade. We're going from 1 percent to eventually will be 100 uh, percent. I think that Tesla will survive and, and, uh, and, and prosper in this. And so the, the simple take is this is quite a roller coaster. It will continue to be a roller coaster in 2019. But I think investors who have a longer term focus should uh, continue to believe in this. Now, I'm curious about your thoughts on another story, the Apple-Spotify dispute. Apple has released its response to Spotify's antitrust complaint. You know, all of this happening in the context of U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren making this argument that tech companies, including Apple, are, are due for a breakup and have too much power. You know, how does that play into this Spotify-Apple issue? And, and, and who do you think is in the right? So I think uh, Apple's in the right. I think uh, Elizabeth Warren is uh, not in the right. Probably not a surprise to hear me say that, because I am uh, generally uh, believe in tech. Uh, I don't think tech should be broken up. But I understand the basic concept of some uh, when, t when tech gets too much power. But I think in Apple's case, one thing that's important about the App Store, and Spotify participates in that, is Apple doesn't really make any revenue from their apps that are available in the App Store. It's just a handful. I mean, they make some revenue if you look at, for example, Apple Music. But for right. the most and part, this really is really small. Right, and that's really what Spotify is talking about here. I mean, Spotify says that Apple claims that Apple got more hostile after it released its own competing music product. Well, just to, I think there's the Spotify and the competitive issue with Apple, and Apple is free to have continue to use its own platform, I think, to its own good. I don't consider that anti-competitive uh, when you look at the market share being globally in terms of smartphones that call it 18 percent. I think it's a hard claim. This is very different than Microsoft with Internet Explorer back uh, 15, 20 years ago. So um, I understand why they would be upset, Spotify would be upset of the music, but I think that if you look at the platform, what's more important is the platform overall. And I think the platform overall is, uh, is, is almost entirely uh, for the good of getting uh, apps out there, and Apple takes their cut of it. What about this Apple Qualcomm uh, you know, developing situation where a judge has now ruled in Qualcomm's favor, and there are still ongoing suits around the world between Apple and Qualcomm, but in this particular case today, 
uh, the ruling favored Qualcomm. So this has uh, been a war of words. It's been a war, a legal war, too. Big judgments, uh, lots of uh, appeals on those judgments, and hard to say how much money has actually changed hands through all this. I think the simple takeaway is this, is the language is very strong between the two companies. There is no love lost here. But ultimately, I think Apple will find a way to work with Qualcomm on the next uh, 5G uh, uh, radio chip. Uh, but down the road, Apple is going to want to do exactly what they did with the A4 chips and uh, the whole A series of chips when they purchased PA Semi. I think they're going to want to vertically integrate this. And so, from my perspective, there may be a few billion dollars changed hands here. It's it's really uh, largely a rounding error. But uh, what's more important is that Apple. This is giving Apple even more. Um, confidence and uh, motivation to vertically integrate around uh, uh, a competitive uh, Qualcomm chip. All right. Well, uh, Qualcomm touted this as a victory. Apple, meantime, continued uh, to say that Qualcomm's ongoing campaign is uh, nothing more than an attempt to distract. So we are, of course, going to continue to follow all of those other suits happening around the world. Gene Munster, as always, of Loop Ventures, good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Still ahead, TPG will let investors pull commitments after one of its executives has been snagged in that college admission scam. We will discuss next. Former Twitter CFO Mike Gupta has joined Plenty, the SoftBank-backed indoor farming startup. Founded in 2014, Plenty is creating vertical farming technology that can produce more in any given area than conventional farms with only a fraction of the water. Gupta previously helped take gaming company Zynga and Twitter public before leaving for Docker in 2015, and he joins Plenty now as CFO as the company looks to expand internationally with plans to grow in China and the Middle East. Let's turn now to another story we've been following all week. TPG has fired Bill McGlashan, founder of the firm's Social Impact Funds, this after he was charged in a wide-ranging criminal college admissions scandal. In a statement, a spokesperson said Bill McGlashan has been terminated for cause from his positions with TPG and rise effective immediately. After reviewing the allegations of personal misconduct in the criminal complaint, we believe the behavior described to be inexcusable and antithetical to the values of our entire organization. McGlashan, who said he sent a letter of resignation to the board, led TPG's business focus on social good and founded its growth investing platform and also recruited several high-profile investors to be part of this effort, including U2's Bono and former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. Sabrina Wilmer, who covers private equity for Bloomberg, joins us from New York to discuss. So, Sabrina, there was some interesting back and forth here where uh, McGlashan resigned. TPG said he was fired. McGlashan released the emails of this whole back and forth. You know, walk us through why this is happening. Yeah, McGlashan basically preempted TPG's firing. If you look at this email exchange that his PR people sent us, basically, because um, McGlashan sent his resignation at 1.02 p.m. yesterday, and then TPG's John Winkleride, who is co-head of the firm, sent an email at 2.03 p.m and basically said, on behalf of TPG, I acknowledge your receipt of your note below. Please see the attached notice of termination of your employment, which we are, were preparing to send you when your note arrived. We will be in touch to advise you of the economic consequences of the termination of your employment. And McGlashan responded, I'm perplexed by your attempt to terminate me because as you acknowledged in your email, you had already, already received my resignation. So why, <laughs> McGlashan is already in a lot of trouble here. Why is he doing this? Is, is he trying to build some sort of case that he deserves some sort of financial compensation? Yeah, I mean, despite it's- Despite being terminated for cause? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's really hard to tell since I haven't talked to him, but usually for cause means that you'll, there, you probably won't get a certain like compensation when you leave so that would I guess that would make sense from his point of view to try to preempt it 
So now, Sabrina, I, what does this mean for TPG and for TPG's investors? Like, how big a blow is this given the, the size of the fund? I think it's more of an optical thing because a lot of TPG's largest investors are big public pension plans and they hate negative news and headline risk. Uh, they, TPG brought in Jim Coulter, the co-head of the firm, to take uh, the, the place of McLash in an interim. So I think investors feel okay about that. And there is, they do have a really big team, more than 100 people on the growth equity and uh, social impact team. So I think that that's fine. It's just uh, optically, it, it doesn't look good. So they're in the middle of raising this social impact fund. It'll be interesting to see how pension plans react, whether they will pull their investments. It, Usually money is locked up for 10 years and LPs really can't get out of the investment. So it is okay. an unusual move for TPG to offer yeah. this. Well, Jim Coulter taking over responsibilities for that fund. So we will see how many investors decide to say. Bloomberg Sabrina Wilmer, thank you. Thank you. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're live streaming on Twitter, of course. You can check us out there at technology. It is Friday. We'll see you back here on Monday.